Good evening and welcome to Duke University uh, Fuqua School of Business Distinguished Speaker Series. It is with uh, enormous pleasure that I note our guest tonight, uh, Sue Gordon, who has had an incredible career in the national intelligence space uh, with a variety of roles uh, and uh, and we'll talk about, uh, talk about some of that uh, as we have our conversation, uh, but currently serving as a Rubenstein Fellow here at Duke University. And we're very, very fortunate to have access to Sue and her incredible expertise, wisdom and insight, which I, I would say is probably, has never been more relevant than it is right now. So Sue, welcome and many, many thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bill. I'm absolutely delighted. Can't. It's a great time to be talking uh, national security. Um, yeah, it's just a perfect time. So thanks for having me. So uh, I, I want to assure our audience that, that we will get to discussing events of, of uh, last week, uh, differences between perhaps President Trump's world outlook and, and President-elect Biden. Uh, but I do want to talk to, uh, to Sue a little bit uh, more personally before we jump to these topics of national security. So uh, what brought you to Duke? Was it to play basketball? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, my, my high school coach had suggested I look into refing because I just wasn't good enough to play on the college level. Uh, I came to Duke because I wanted to be a world famous marine biologist. And there weren't many programs around the country. The best was at Florida Institute, Institute of Technology. And I thought, well, that'd be great if I actually turn into a marine biologist, but what if I don't? Uh, maybe I ought to have a more broad based education. And I looked around and Duke had the Marine Science Consortium on the East Coast. Uh, and I thought, well, that's perfect, right? I can go to Duke. Um, right size school, great reputation, um, good sports school. That's where I'm going and I'll spring, spend spring semesters in uh, Beaufort. And then I made the basketball team and I never got there. So uh, is it really true that you, uh, you were a three-time captain of the basketball team? I was. Um, I, I find that surprising. Um, if I add in the fact that I only started one game um, and that was the senior game, I call it the pity game my senior year. And I didn't even play enough games as a sophomore the first year I was captain to earn a letter. Um, so I, I, one, I wonder, I asked my teammates and my coaches all the time, what were you thinking? Um, they would have to give you their answer. Uh, but I actually take great pride and I, and I love telling the message that you can lead from where you are um, we most often think either you have to be venerable, a senior, or a standout when you're younger. And the truth is, if you do what the team needs, um, you'll get the chance to lead. So clearly, at a, at a very early age, someone saw in you this, this ability to, uh, to lead a team. And, and of course, over the, uh, the, the professional journey you've had, you've led many great teams. And so I'm just curious. Uh, what what can you share with us in, in terms of what you've learned over time in terms of how to be a great leader of a great team? Well, I do think uh, for me, uh, two great, uh, three great foundations uh, for the success with which I've been graced. One, my mom and dad taught me two really important things. One, always do, always do your best. Um, and always give something to the cause. So that's pretty foundational. Um, Duke taught me about critical thinking um, and ability to kind of have this insatiable curiosity that turned out to be really useful um, in my profession. But I would say just in general, as a leader, a leader who's curious is gonna be one that's gonna take more risks, imagine bigger goals, pursue bigger outcomes. Um, and then sports, uh, I think for me, and I think for a lot of women, um, you learn that conflict isn't bad. So you can, you know, deal with kind of the internecine warfare that you have in any business place. 
And even more than that, you learn how to be dependent upon and how to depend on others. Both of those are really important, I think, skills as a leader. It keeps you um, driving when you're the one who must drive, but go ahead and be humble and sit back when the organization is taking you where it must. So probably those three things. Okay. So at, at various times, depending on, on the role that, that you assumed, you've probably been in a male dominated world. Uh, and so I'm curious if you can give us some, some advice in terms of, uh, it, because certainly the, the business world has been in male dominated in some sectors. So this is not a unique occurrence. Um, so what, what advice can you give to men first in terms of making sure that women feel like they're on the team in this environment? And then what advice can you give to women to make sure that they are on the team? Um, so what, what have you, what have, insights have you gained uh, in, in terms of these, these gender roles uh, in, in your working life? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And, and for as many times as I've been asked it, I think that's a, a different formulation. So maybe I'll come up with a different answer. Um, what advice I'd give men and actually organizations in general, and that is excellence doesn't have only one look. Um, leadership does not always look like a white civil war general, which is really the model of what we think leaders should be. Leaders must be a certain set of things. They have to have vision. They have to have integrity. They have to have drive um, and just a number of, they must inspire. But how they do those things can be very different. And I think one of the things you see as you get more women into leadership positions, you really sense this, oh my gosh, they're good leaders and they don't look like everyone else. Um, and so I think that would be the one thing is don't think that excellence always has the same form. Look at the outcome being produced, give room for difference and it'll carry you on your way. Interesting enough, Coach K, one of the reasons why he's successful is because he recognizes excellence in different form. He doesn't take all his players. They don't, he doesn't, hire, he doesn't recruit all the same athletes and he doesn't treat them all the same. So I think recognizing difference. For my female colleagues, what I would say is probably two things, um, especially early on, uh, focus on being great yourself. Don't tell yourself that your performance is not dictated by what someone else does. And so number one is nose down. And the second is, but for goodness sake, hold your space. Don't let anyone make you small. Don't let anyone ask you to be less than you are. Hold your space, but just focus ruthlessly on the job you're doing and you'll find your way because I wish organizations had enough soul to actually care about individuals, either making them succeed or allowing them to fail. The truth is the organization is going to recognize performance, success and outcome deliver outcome and you're going to be all right. So thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of, uh, of your, your professional life is that uh, for most of us, we, we really have fears about what's happening in the world. And sometimes we actually get a direct look at why we, why we have reason to be afraid. Uh, but but you you know <laughs> you know a lot about why the world is such a scary place, and, and this is actually a serious question, uh, which is knowing what you know, how do you sleep at night? But but really, what I mean by that is how how do you stay positive and composed in an environment where where many people will face stresses, not perhaps the stresses that you face in in your career, but but how do you stay focused and positive? Um, in when you're dealing with issues that are so very, very challenging? Um, that's a great question. And boy, these days are, are great examples of that. Um, I, I think probably um, in the abstract, uh, 
what has carried me through, you know, when you're, when you're younger, less experienced, you have so much hubris, you know, which is great because it makes you attempt things. You just, you just believe so much and you think you know so much that you take off and do things. And I think that is so important and so important to husband and the people that are coming into the universities and the workforce now is to keep that belief that they can make a difference almost irrespective of the difference that they're going to make just believing they can do it and so um i think that's that's one as you get more experience what i've seen are incredible accomplishments uh incredible heroism incredible selflessness i've seen the greatness of the american uh, industrial base that is so ingenious, so driven. I've seen the selflessness of citizens that should be destroyed by things that happen to them. And yet, when you talk to them, they are comforting you about things. And so there is a, there is a great spirit and great ability in this nation um, that has been born over many years. So one is just that. Two is I always feel the responsibility of carrying on what my predecessors have done. So it's just this belief of the fundamental opportunities we have and the responsibility to carry through. When you have a career that I didn't do and that you look at the world the one thing that is true is there are people and nations who will try to advance their interests at the expense of yours. It's hard to call it good or bad because everyone thinks they're the good guy, but there are people who are more willing to take, more willing to overcome, more willing to do different things. And that is everywhere. And totalitarian regimes particularly can look well organized and focused and open societies can look disorganized and chaotic. And sometimes you wonder, holy smokes, how is this merry band of revolutionaries gonna hold off on that? But the truth is nothing is perfect, not our adversaries, not us. And it really is just constant attention to what must be and then working like a dog to make it happen. Um, what is harder in this moment is because we have been able to rely on our institutions to be our stability, even as leadership goes in and out. That's been one of the great strengths of America. And what you're seeing right now is our institutions are flagging a bit. They're not quite as up to the moment as they have been in the past. And so you now see more variability with individuals and that is disquieting and it makes you imagine, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe our system isn't gonna hold, maybe we're not gonna get to be 300 years. Um, and so I think it's those tensions um, that you see, but I always come back to, and if you'll allow Bill, I think one of the things we aren't talking about in this moment are a lot of the really, truly triumphant displays of the fundamental strength of our representative republic. Um, what you saw is record numbers of Americans coming out to vote, huge record numbers doing what they almost never do, which is decide that an incumbent with run left isn't going to return to office. That's a triumph of our system. You have seen bureaucrats ranging from Vice President Pence who decides to send a letter to, to President Trump and say, sorry, as I read the constitution, I have a constitutional duty to do this. And you see, little 
um, not well-known bureaucrats in states, the secretaries of state, deciding to um, certify elections under withering pressure. And interestingly, almost regardless of what they believe. So there have been a lot of triumphs in the midst of it. And to me, that that still exists. I know that our system that is open is the right one. So even when we're being hacked and attacked, when I'm seeing the rise of violent extremism in my own country, I think you still see a lot of the foundations that can be built on. So we ought to get to work. So uh, I, I like your positive attitude and, and your ability to, to see the, the really heroic behaviors uh, along with some of the really extremely bad but we, better, but we better work because it does feel that we have forgotten that it's not a given. As a matter of fact, I think you could look over these four years and say that norms have been shattered that we never thought would be shattered. And so what are we doing to make sure that our generation contributes to building the nation? And, and in fact, I, I want to come to this in, in just a minute. Uh, I, I think that some of the things that you've said suggest that we've shot ourselves in the foot in, in this process. So, uh, but, but I, I, will, I will do the unfortunate thing of reading your words back to you, um, which is never fair. But uh, so uh, before, before I do that, though, um, what's, you know, what, just a little more focus on your career before we, we get to deep into these, these events. So you establish yourself as a, as a trusted advisor. Um, you, you advised, you were in the room with, with many different presidents, mm -hmm. uh, Democratic, Republican, uh, it, it, it didn't matter, you were a trusted advisor. And so for our our students, they're going to be in roles where they'll be looked to for advice. And, and my, my question is, how, how does one become a trusted advisor? What are the key things that, that make you effective in that role? Um, I was about to laugh. All my friends tell me I always uh, have three things. And I was just about to say, so three things. Um, one, you have to be really good at your job. You, um, if you don't understand what you're doing, if you don't understand your craft, if you don't understand the limits of it, if you don't have knowledge that's so good, you can play with it. And what that means is you don't just repeat the reports that have been given, but you understand their foundation so that when circumstances beyond or when a question isn't expected, you can dive into it. I think that's the first most important thing. We don't talk about being really good as much as you want. So that's the first. Um, the second is you have to ruthlessly care more about the outcome than you do about protecting any self-interest. And I'm, I'm setting aside taking care of yourself as a human and all that. I'm, I'm talking about I'm going to take on a job. I understand what it is, and I'm not going to worry about whether I'm going to look good. And I'm not going to worry about what people think of me. And I'm not going to worry about whether I'm going to get promoted or whether everyone's going to think something that I am. I'm not going to worry about whether my colleague's going to get mad at me when I recommend something. So if you ruthlessly pursue the outcome and the mission, you're going to be okay. And weirdly, people will forgive you mistakes because you will make mistakes even with that but they will know that it was a mistake of effort um, and then I think the third thing you have to do is be willing to consider the possibility that you're wrong um, because there are plenty of times when you will do the work you'll have the outcome you will see it so clearly you will be so intentional in doing the right thing that you will miss data or just miss that somebody knows something that you don't and you will hold too dogmatically. And so I think the last one is, if you're ever righteous, you're wrong, right? 
And so those three things, I think, allow you to become someone who is trusted. That does not mean that you're always right. It just means you're pursuing things rightly and people will forgive mistakes. So as you, as you did your job, you clearly lived up to those three things and you were trusted. You, uh, you were trusted by both, both parties. The, it, when it came time, uh, when uh, Coates uh, stepped down, the, both Democrats and Republicans saw you as the obvious choice because they trusted you so much to step into the role uh, as, as uh, director of national intelligence. And yet, uh, instead of pushing for that role, you submitted your resignation. So can you, can you tell us, I, I hope this isn't too personal or too painful, you know, why, what, what led you to submit a resignation in that moment? Um, it is both personal and painful, but it's okay. So, and I, and I think it's instructive because you, you just don't, you, you don't know, right? I certainly didn't see it coming. So I'll tell you just kind of how un, events unfolded and then I'll tell you how I thought of it. Uh, here's the way events unfolded uh, behind the scenes. Um, we knew that Dan Coates was gonna be replaced. He and the president weren't getting along. Um, they came to a mutual agreement that it was time to part ways. We had thought it was gonna be in the fall, um, but we knew he was going to go. Um, the statute says, this is written in law, that in the absence of the director of national intelligence, the principal deputy shall become the acting director, shall. Um, Congress wrote it in as part of the legislation that formed the DNI, and so it was written there as incontrovertible. Unfortunately, that same statute had been in place at the Department of Homeland Security when Kirsten Nielsen uh, resigned, was asked to leave. And my friend Claire Grady, another civil servant who was in the deputy position, they forced her to resign because they wanted to put a political appointee in ahead of her and the same statute, protected, a, a similar statute protected her. So as Dan was unfolding, I went to the White House over the summer and I said, here's the deal gang, you are gonna make me acting director, right? And they said, oh yeah, absolutely. I said, because if you're not gonna make me acting director, let me know now, because if you don't let me ascend, it will impute to me. And they said, don't worry. Don't worry. And on July 20th, I leave for uh, a week and a half leave to see my new grandbaby. And on 28 July, Dan Coates is fired in a tweet. And the last line of the tweet was, I will be naming an acting director shortly. And <laughs> my phone blew up and I'm like, what? And it was like, oh, he probably just didn't know. And I'm like, nah, this means something else. And then what unfolded with, over the next two weeks was the Congress trying to get the president, to me to hang in there, the Congress trying to get the president to let me do what statutorily I was supposed to. And he and his team around him wanted someone that they trusted, which in this case was a political appointee that the machine believed would, was loyal. Um, and for two weeks, I had several conversations with the president and several conversations with many senators on the Hill. Um, the worst thing that happened to me was the Republican senators said it quietly, the Democratic senators and congressmen. So when Adam Schiff and Rod Rosenstein um, and Mark Warner came out and said, Sue is the best person ever, how do we think this went over in this political environment? It was almost like the thing that made me attractive all of a sudden became a negative. Um, and then one day we're coming up um, toward the 15th of August when Dan was gonna leave. And I thought I'd won the president over. And then he, Dan came back from a meeting. He said, nope, they're gonna, they're gonna go with someone else. And so my choice was at that moment 
where he wasn't going to let me ascend to the position, what do you do then? And your choices are you can burn down the house, you can force yourself to be fired publicly. The lawyers had said that he probably would win the statute fight. Um, or if you're the third child of an able officer, you say, well, he is the person who appointed me. If he wants somebody else, even though in Dan's case, he was taking away a political appointee's job. In my case, he was, he was ending a 40 year career. You still say a cheery aye aye. I really was afraid if we made it a fight, it would be yet another thing that the president hated the intelligence community over. And then the last thing is, I didn't want to make it seem to my women and men that I thought I was the only person or the important person. So I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but to be clear, it was a choice to do it that way when it was clear he wasn't gonna let me ascend. Okay. So it was kind of long-winded, but I hope it's clear. But, but, but ultimately your, your choice was that you were going to serve your country as best you could. Yeah, I would, I, um, and in that moment, I thought the better part of service was to, not, I mean, how is it gonna work, right? So he clearly wanted somebody else. Let's say we get the lawyers to tell him he has to keep me. How is that gonna work for the intelligence community? Was that gonna do better for us or not? So I, I don't know if I did the right thing. I know the Congress was mad at me, um, but it did at that point allow us to move on. It was really hard to watch the guy that succeeded me sit through the Ukraine hearings because I, I should have been in the foxhole with my mates. The hearings would have gone differently with someone who was ready for the job. So it, how events unfolded have been difficult for me because oddly I feel like I left them. But what we both know is not only did I not have a choice, but as my friends say, had I stayed, I would have been fired every successive day. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done something that would have, you know, played intelligence down the middle and then I would have been gone and gone and gone. Okay, so, uh, so speaking of playing things down the middle, I'm going to read you a quote. And so I want to shift to talking about the election and, and now uh, the, the consequences of that election. So what, what you said is the following. There is a piece of me that's listening to our national discussion that centers around telling our citizens that either you can't trust your institutions or you can't trust the voting process or you can't trust the other guys. If I'm sitting in our adversary's shoes, they're sitting back and going, yes, we've achieved our aim. So, so how, how, do, how do we get ourselves in this position? Was there, was there foreign interference that essentially helped produce these effects that amplified in different ways the, the, the stories that were being told that really were, were disrupting our faith in these institutions. So probably three factors. Now, we're now gonna laugh about this forever. Um, we talk about the Russians so much in intelligence, um, not just because we saw their efforts in the 2016 election, but because we know who they are from a doctrinal perspective and their doctrine for as long as I've been in the intelligence community has been to undermine democracy. In the Cold War, they had a thing called active measures, which was really psyops. And active measures to them was launching an activity to cause a rift in society and then just watching it take on and get a life of its own. And what we know about Russia is they are a really good intelligence service and they have really good command of the digital environment and cyber. And so if you have that doctrine, 
they see elections as a front they can use and they have the benefit of cyber that has a speed, a volumetric aspect and no cost, no doubt at all that they have used their capabilities to sow discontent and rifts in our society, in addition to efforts that were thwarted to directly affect elections. But do you see, do we have we seen activity that is sending false messages, sending divisive messages, amplifying messages that are going on? So no doubt, um, other adversaries do it differently. Um, Iran achieves their aims differently and a little more ham-handed. China tends to be more on influencing people to have favorable views toward China. So it's all different, but Russia's we know is undermining our society. So that's one. And then there are two other things that were going on. Number one is as we've grown as a nation, as the income disparity and opportunity disparity has grown, just within our own society, we have divisions growing and you see those. And then our leadership has gotten more and more divisive. And so you have our own leaders sending messages of these guys are against us and only these people are for us. And the combination of those three things, our adversarial's ability to um, exploit those rifts, natural change, not natural, changes in our society and then leadership that seems, these are my words, that are bereft of understanding what the role of government really is about and are more hyper-partisan than they should be have caused this moment. So I don't think you can pin it on any one without the other, but the three is a pretty significant perfect storm. So if we, if we look at what happened uh, last week, there's clear evidence that uh, you know, there uh, apparently all kinds of people but without a doubt, there were extremists, there were white supremacists involved in, in these riots. And so uh, there, there are lots of kind of public accounts that, that extremism is one of the biggest threats to our national security. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, is, is there a division where, because this is on our soil, that's not a national intelligence question, uh, that that would fall in in the domain that you lived in, but but then you have operatives from other countries using mechanisms on our soil. So how do you uh, how how does one sort through this? Uh, given we have some serious issues that have been revealed. Yeah. So one, I think I think uh, I don't I don't know that the Biden administration thought this was going to be in the forefront, but it most assuredly is. Um, and it is a real issue. Um, for those of us who've been in the intelligence community a long time and saw the rise of Islamic extremism and terrorist activity, you can look at this and see that there are some similar aspects to see what you have it happening here. Um, and you can know that some of our early actions against that extremism overseas were not universally helpful. We actually did some things in the nation that actually gave power to some of those groups. And so we ought to learn some lessons. So this is serious and the Biden administration is gonna to have to take it on. Two, it is difficult when it, more difficult when it's here than there because of our rights and privileges, because of privacy. Um, we don't have intelligence activity on our own people. We have law enforcement activities, but that tends to be evidentiary rather than looking at what's going on and inductive. And so it is harder to get the combined benefit of law enforcement and intelligence when it's your own nation state. 
The third thing is there is no natural single agency that really needs to come together. I think you're almost gonna have to do something like the 9-11 commission and say, let's look at this and do we need to get the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI and the intelligence community to almost create a new entity to focus on this because it's real, right? And, it, and, and I would say, um, listen, I put a, a lot of responsibility on the president in any case, because they're the president. I think this president um, did things that actually fomented it. But if we think that just President Trump not being President Trump, he was not the one that started it and it will not end with his departure. This is something that we're gonna have to deal with as a nation. And um, it's, it's significant, not unovercomable, but it isn't something that can be swept under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. Just like you can't present, pretend racism doesn't exist. You can't present, pretend that there is an extremism here. So can we talk about the, the response to the riots? And uh, some of the accounts that I've read are, are really uh, frightening in the sense of an inability to, to respond to desperate pleas for help and coordination, and of course, this is you know back to the theme of how do we actually coordinate activities domestically. This is something that you are charged to do to figure out how do we how do we coordinate assets uh, in the intelligence community, which are spread out over a number of different groups. So, uh, did did you have any reaction to this this inability to coordinate a response and 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 kind of lessons you've learned that where people could in the heat of the moment, respond more effectively and, and, uh, and get the right people, the right place, the right time. Yeah, that was just so appalling. It was an appalling lack of imagination about how it was gonna unfold. Um, it was an appalling uh, lack of understanding of the president's responsibility you know, we tell leaders all the time that as you rise, your voice is amplified. What was he doing at that rally? And what did he expect to happen? Um, and then I think you also see that our bureaucracies, while we need them, while they do provide a foundation, are really flagging in terms of their ability to move swiftly, to act non-predictably or act agilely and too little judgment being affected by the leaders and too much expectation that some sort of arcane process is the better way to make decisions and solve problems. So I think you see all of those. I worry a lot about how our bureaucracies are struggling to meet the speed of the world I also worry a lot that they've been denigrated over the last four years. You know, the American people have been told that you can't trust your government and, or they're the deep state or something like that, really? Uh, I'm the biggest critic of bureaucracies of anyone I know that loves them, but they are not malfeasant. They need to be repaired and made modern. Where are those leaders gonna come from? If you watch the COVID press briefings over the summer, if you're like me, there were there was there were lots of there was lots of thoughts that came out of them. But one to me was, oh my gosh, we need government, and oh my gosh, our government's not good enough, and oh my gosh, the private sector can really help, but oh my gosh, the private sector is not prepared to operate at scale, and those fundamental organizational institutional bureaucratic issues need to be addressed and I don't hear us talking about those um, and it's one of the reasons why you're so kind to let me uh, have a class is to hope we can build some of the leaders that are going to be able to take on those kind of challenges but I think it's all of them our institutions are not up to the speed of the world or the diversity of decisions you need to make and there was a failure of imagination and there was a failure of leadership. And again, kind of all crashed together. 
So uh, another example that's very prominent right now in terms of this intersection between uh, the private sector and, and government and, and how we're going to respond is the social media platforms. And, and so you know, what, what is your reaction to the move that has been made by some of these technology companies to deny access? I mean, th this, is not, this is not a government decision. This is a decision being made in the private sector uh, to, to silence some of these platforms. The same platforms that, that have been used by foreign actors to amplify and distort activity. So what do we do about harnessing the technology that is you know, being, being used to make companies a lot of money uh, and, and improve lives in many other ways that, that is now being seen to have these harmful effects? Right. Um... So it's like the halcyon days are, are over. Back in the day when I started, you know, the government had all the big ideas and it was government funding and government control of technologies. And then uh, the internet happened and the world became our oyster and companies grew up and there was so many things they can do. And we have benefited by the Googles and the Facebooks and all these companies but it was like there were kids in candy stores thinking only about what they could get and nothing about their responsibility. Um, I remember the hearings early on with, with Mark Zuckerberg after the Russian interference came out and the look on her face was like, oh my God, I'm responsible. And so the government, we're not putting the genie back in the bottle. The government can't just regulate our way out of everything these companies have got to have some responsibility for what they're doing. And they're trying to. So we have a government that can't control these out of control things. Everyone, we've done a great job talking about what's happening in disinformation and what bad actors are doing. So what to do about it? And so now you see these companies that are thinking, oh my gosh, we are responsible. And you see them taking action. And, there, and there's a lot of action behind the scenes to get rid of falsehoods and false accounts. But what about all this really public stuff? And so now you see them doing things like labeling content and denying users. I'm not sure that's really the way we're going to end up going, but I do like that they are trying to, that they do recognize their role and they're trying to do something to stem the tide of what we know is harmful. The promulgation of not true information, particularly when it is purposeful promulgation is harmful. And so I like that the companies are trying to do something they are ham-handed in some ways. And so I think you're gonna to have to see the government come together on this disinformation piece and help them out. But I, but I guess I admire the attempt because I don't, else, don't know what else we were gonna do in the short haul to try and stem a tide. And I think in a weird sort of way, we did just a little too late to stop the rise of some of these things. So, in, in your world, uh, technology is definitely, you know, probably a source of, of positive things, but a source of many, many threats. And so cybersecurity has become yep. really challenging. And, and of course, we see the very public uh, Russian hack uh, that, that has been in the headlines. Um, so can we, can we protect ourselves? I mean, is there such a thing as cybersecurity in a world where we've created so many technology connections to benefit society without thinking that they're bad actors out there. So what, how, how, do we, how do we actually have a world where cybersecurity is a real thing? Um, so I think you have to constantly keep up the fight to make sure that you're operating securely. Um, from a company perspective, I would say the CEOs and the boards have to get involved because too many companies see cybersecurity is a cost. And so you don't invest because if nothing has happened, you think that that's all wasted money. And, and what we know is 
even if you're not the target, you're the transportation to another target. Look at solar winds. No one wanted solar winds. What they wanted to do was use solar winds to get someplace else. So constant vigilance, cyber hygiene, we probably are going to have to come up with some standards like the generally accepted accounting principles gap that came up after the stock market crash in 29. We probably need to come up, I've got a name for it, it's called GASP. <gasps> and you would never say that, <laughs> but generally accepted security principles. I think I think something will happen that says if you're a publicly traded company, you have to apply. So good cyber hygiene will is like locking your front door. It discourages the easily discouraged. The second thing is we have to stop expecting technology to do all the work. If you communicate, you're vulnerable. And so how are you managing the risk, right? Do companies understand what their risk posture are and are they protecting not all of it, but the things that are important? And are you trying to make technology do all the work? You know, in the, in the intelligence community, uh, we're far from perfect, but we tend to have fewer of these things in part because security is physical and security is personal and security is technical. In too many companies, they don't invest in the security of their people. Um, and especially now that we're so scattered to the winds, I think these will be issues, um, but mostly understand what the risk is and understand that if you're part of an ecosystem, you have responsibility for what's happening in the person that uses it. Big, big hard thing to do. Um, what isn't going to happen is um, people aren't going to stop using the digital environment to spy on each other. You can impose more cost when cost is incurred on that. Systems have got to learn to be able to take a punch. Um, and we have to develop effective deterrence. This is a bit, this is a big challenge for us. So uh, are we turning to the, 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 the global stage? Trump was certainly a, a non-traditional uh, president in terms of managing different relationships. Uh, perhaps some of these that was to our benefit and perhaps for others it was not. So can, can you kind of comment on where you think uh, he actually helped the U.S. standing and, and where you think the Biden administration may need to step in uh, and take actions to repair relationships? So I, I uh, let's see, where would I give credit? Um, uh, China had been a problem for a long time. Um, I, I think because their real incursion was more economic than political or military, we weren't dealing with as much as we might. We weren't dealing with the economic and the intellectual property theft. Property theft. I think you have to give the Trump administration um, a lot of credit for recognizing the seriousness of the China threat and organizing a bit against it. Um, I think. I think you have to look at the Middle East and say that there is more, it is more peaceful now than when he took office. Um, the recognition of Israel by some Arab states is a really good trend. Um, I think Iran is too, too close to call. We certainly sanctioned them such that they are not capable of the same malign action that they were before, but I don't know that that's a long-term solution. I think there are some treaties like intermediate nuclear forces um, that we have with Russia that we needed to get out of because it wasn't being upheld and it was threatening Europe. So those are a set of things. Um, but there's another set of things. Um, we basically treated our allies like our adversaries. Um, one of the great strengths of America had been that we had friends and others didn't. Um, and that has diminished a bit. I don't know if the situation last summer or summer before last with Iran had escalated. I don't know whether we would have been able to command the coalition to deal with it if it had gone further. Um, yes, NATO is contributing more dollars, but I think we've broken the spirit of NATO uh, too. Um, and so um, I, uh, I don't know that we've done much with cyber. I think the, in the national security challenges that I mentioned of cyber and pandemics, how did we miss that? 
um, that was less of an intelligence failure than it was a response issue. Um, so um, I think the biggest problem that I had with the president is um, he opened up a huge gap between his actions and the system's actions. And so they weren't connected. Second and third order effects. We don't know how long the good things he did will last because they're so relatively unsupported by the structure. Um, uh, and so because of that gap, institutions started getting further and further away from the action and they can devolve into not handling all the actions they could. And so there's a, there's a real underpinning of weakness in the system that was engendered by the way he led. Um, the, but he did tackle problems that we knew were issues that we hadn't had solution to. North Korea is a great example. I don't know where we are now, but we have not had any, they have not had any nuclear tests in the past three years. And when he took office, they had had a series of um, multiple nuclear capable missile launches almost every month for a year and several nuclear tests. But the question, but Biden will be in charge of Trump's legacy. Can they take these gains and make them systemic? And can they do that while they're trying to repair alliances and deal with the new national security threats that we have is a real question. I think the open-ended question about the Biden administration is, it is so much the Obama administration, but this is not 2009 when they came into office. It is a really different world than it was four years ago. Again, not just because of President Trump, but because it's a different world than it was four years ago. So the question is, will this team come in thinking that they're going to do those things? I think they have a lot of tests in front of them. A lot of really good people that they've brought in, but it will test them. So I don't know if this is an unfair characterization, but but perhaps you could you could say Trump treated these uh, interactions is more transactional on the global stage, and and the uh, you know, previous presidents uh, treated them as more relational. And Biden has talked a lot about reestablishing these relationships. But but is is it the case that you know to your point that the world has moved on, and and the world is more transactional? Uh, so are, are, can we get back to a world where? the U.S. has the same kind of role in, in the world that it had previously, or have we really moved into a new era here? So I think the world needs the U.S. to lead. Um, even if it's not with huge dollars, it's with presence, it's with statement of what, statements of what's important. Um, our presence matters. Um, I think we are far from imperfect but our ideals are still not those of totalitarian regimes and imposing will on other, particularly being taking advantage of those who are weaker. So I think the world needs us as a leader, but we have to lead in a way that's relevant for a world that is more connected, more capable, has more pesky sovereignty, you want more partners than people that will just do what you say. And so I think there's an opportunity and a necessity, but a challenge of, you know, when I started partnering with the US was, we'll provide security and you do what we say. That is not gonna be, that isn't the way it works now. You know, this connected world has given people wherewithal to have their own views about their own fates. You know, even our closest partners, the UK, had a hard time coming along with us in terms of banning Chinese technology. And, and that would almost have been anathema three to four years ago. So dealing with a world that is more capable, more independent, more populist, and still being a leader is going to be, I think, the big test of the Biden administration. So... Um, 
the, the world, uh, kind of coming back to a theme that, that I started with, the, the world is full of peril. Uh, some of us now have been exposed to, uh, you know, open, open crack in uh, how the world works. Uh, yes. Uh, and so it's, it's probably likely that we'll continue to see some ongoing crises uh, in, you know, here at home and, and around the world. And so given your experience, do you have any advice for us in terms of basic crisis management? Uh, I mean, we're, we're facing you know, an enormous set of crises simultaneously in this country. Uh, you know, what, what can we take away from these, these really trying times and use productively as we move ahead? So there's that old saying that all politics are local. Well, all crises are local too. And I think one of the things that we learned over the last four years is we've got to get better connectivity between the resources and the wherewithal of the federal government. And despite the separation we like to have, I think we have to um, better engage state and local. You know, the vaccine distribution is a great example. Yes, that should be a local issue, but the resources required to do that effectively and the infrastructure needed to be better provided by the federal government. So I think number one is get our state and local better connected to the bigger issues. Um, the second is, um, I, listen, truth and trust are the foundation of a free and open society. We have got to insist on integrity in our communications. Um, and it, whether that is communications medium or whether those are the communications themselves. Um, and our citizenry is not helping that when they only listen to one set of voices and promulgate things that they can't validate themselves. So citizenry that is a little bit more critical thinking and recognizing the destruction of disinformation um, is probably the second. And, and then I think, I think the third is, um, I do like the activism that I see. You know, I, I, I think we've awakened to our imperfection and uh, being participative, um, not an insurrectionist, not believing that there's no good here, but recognizing that it does take our contribution to be there. And I think this time I'm gonna have, this time I'm gonna have a, a, a fourth one. Um, we're not alone. Right, the the person next to you is more like you. Um, believe in that foundation, and for goodness' sake, don't let government privilege escalate. Government privilege tends to escalate when the populace feels helpless. Let's have a populace that feels like it has power and then government privilege will stay where it has been in this country and I think we'll find our way. So Sue, thank you so much for being completely candid uh, and, and wise and insightful, but also in these very, very trying times and, and this past week has, has really been tough. Thank you for leaving us with a sense of optimism as well. My honor. Let's go get them, go Duke. All right, thank you. You bet.